Good morning and uh, welcome to another In The Room uh, webinar. Today we with with Core Shares, with Gareth Stobie and Chris Rule. Welcome guys. Well, thanks Steve. Yeah, and uh, first of all, actually thanks for having us. I think, that's, I think that's the exciting thing for me. I mean, it's a, it's a miserable, cold, rainy day in Sant and Joburg, but it's really cool to be actually in Core Shares offices. Um, and we haven't, haven't been able to do that for, for a while. So yeah, so thanks very much guys for, for having us. Pleasure having you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so today, um, as I said, um, I'm Steve Backhouse, as I, as I, say, I often forget to uh, introduce myself and I'll be hosting the webinar. Um, and we're very much going to be unpacking evidence-based investing, EBI, we love our acronyms. Um, uh, but before we get going, we'll, we'll just go through a couple of house rules. Um, as always, one hour, one hour interactive webinar Please post questions uh, to, 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 to myself, uh, Gareth and Chris via the Q&A tab. And my colleague Arifa does, does moderate those and then post them to us. Um, as I say, we'll chat for the kind of the first 25, 20, 25 minutes, uh, the three of us, ask questions, interactive discussion. Then we'll open the questions to, to the floor. Uh, as I say, it's one hour, so we end 10.30 sharp. Uh, one thing I do need to watch out for is load shedding. So we are on generator, but if I think if the genie does go down and we switch back to ESCOM, the lights might go out, but hopefully the, the actual, um, the actual uh, webinar will continue. We have no hiccups. If, it, if there is a hiccup, I think just stay online. Um, we will come back online. Um, so don't, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, the all important CPD points. So you get one CPD point for this webinar. That's already been approved. Uh, what you need to do is attend basically 90% of the webinar and it's automatic. If you do drop off or for whatever reason, uh, you'll receive an email with a short assessment which you complete to get your, your CPD point. Um, I, think that's, I think that's everything. So yeah, otherwise we can get, get stuck into to, to the discussion. So first of all, I mean, it's yeah, so great, great to be here. Um, so nice to come to your offices, mm -hmm. see, see the vibe. I mean, it's nice to drive through kind of through sentencing, the traffic pickup as life slowly does does return return to normal, um, but yeah, I mean, Gareth, I mean, tell us a little bit about core shares. We know you're kind of a it's index type type of uh, business ETF. I mean, but where I mean, where did when did it start? And what's 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 the story? Okay, so core, the core shares brand has just turned six, um, but a number of our funds predates the 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 actual brand launch. Uh, so the business was originally started within the uh, Grinrod group of uh, companies, uh, Grinrod Financial Services, where, where Chris and I both both worked. Uh, in my prior life, um, I moved between banking and asset management. I sort of oscillated between the two. Uh, and I found myself working in a banking division that had an asset management flair to it, which was basically launching uh, ETFs. Uh, and at the time, I, I went overseas and, and, and had a look at what was going on in the broader indexing ETF world and got really excited around the general movement towards passive investing, um, using ETFs within that context and so forth. Uh, and so we, we well, I, Chris was involved as well, we, we put a, a business plan together for Grinrod to say, let's launch an independent uh, contemporary uh, passive brand and, and cobble together what we'd already built at Grinrod and move it across into a new, a new vehicle, which, which then became uh, CoreShares. It was around about that time that we also invited a couple of other corporate shareholders to join the journey. So today our corporate funding comes from Grinrod Still, uh, RMI and Outsurance. So they are our corporate base of, of, of funders. Uh, and, and basically the plan was to, as I say, build an independent uh, passive uh, business and really try and catch many of the global tailwinds around passive. So it's the general move towards passive, I think. When we first launched the business, Passive made up, say, 4% of the South African CIS market. That's more or less doubled over the last five years. We've okay. kind of 7 yeah. 8, 8% now. So it hasn't had this quantum leap, but certainly it's been trending very steadily upwards, as it has been uh, globally. Then looking at developments like Smart Beta, which is alternative types of indices, 
the ETF product wrapper itself, which has got a particular sort of vibrancy um, uh, to it. Uh, you know, it sits in different ecosystems of administration, lots of online stockbroking platforms, that type of thing. And then also how um, passive hangs together with uh, technology and, and fintech in general. So if you, if you think about um, trying to plan some sort of advice journey where out pops an asset allocation at the end of it, passive is very helpful in that context because you get very pure asset allocation kind of allocations that come out of that. So, so lots of industry trends supporting the growth of passive. Yeah. And, and we wanted to position, uh, as I say, a contemporary brand into, into that space that was well-funded, well-resourced, uh, and, and, off, and off we went. And, and, and so we launched that brand, as I say, in 2015. The name Core Shares comes from um, the idea of core satellite investing, uh, which is important because right from the outset, we identified that in a market that's been dominated by active management, people aren't going to just suddenly switch from active to passive. Rather, you want to make a sensible argument around why, why passive works, why it's important, and to build the core of your portfolio using passive, but then by all means, you know, have other satellite positions. So core satellites is at the way of portfolio constructions at the heart of core shares is named. Okay. Uh, and, and that's where we got, we got our, our, our name from. Yeah. Okay. And that's what I mean, I suppose, the Grinrod um, kind of share things while you we sit in the Grinrod Tower. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 They've, they've been a, um, involved in our business right from the start. We, we've got a, we share some office. Well, we don't share that we pay them rent, but we, yeah. we <laughs> sit in their building. Yeah. No. Uh, and and we're very generous with, with them. With their, <laughs> with their yeah. executive team in that. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. And Chris, I mean, you, I mean, as Gary said, you've been involved from the start as well. That's correct. Um, yeah. yeah. So tell us about, about your, your journey. Yes. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's 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 an interesting journey because you know when when the whole kind of conceptually when the business started, yes, there were all these tailwinds. But if you looked at the South African market, there was this business opportunity, but there was also a massive investment opportunity because you know, passive was hugely underrepresented in our market. Gareth mentioned. It's doubled. I mean, that that's some going, you know. But do you? Double. I mean, do you? I mean, just so like think about like the international stage on that that point. Yeah. Like it's passive investing. It's it's big. I mean, you've yeah. got these seriously big big exactly. passive businesses or BlackRock, I think of Van, Van, Vanguard with the issues part. Of it. And then I mean, do you think that I mean, there's we've grown in terms of in our industry as, as much as we could have. Or do you think there's a lot more still to come? I, I think there's a long way to go. I th you know, in the US, it's getting close to parity, passive and active. Yeah. Right? So almost 50-50. The rest of the market is quite a bit behind that. So closer to 20%. We're sitting at eight. Yeah. So, you know, I think we'll get there. I mean, what, what we often forget is that passive really, the noise started picking up in the US in the late 70s. It was only in the, you know, early 2000s and then post the financial crisis you know, in 08, where Passive really picked up ahead of Steam. And it was it was because clients wanted to know what they were buying and that they wanted the transparency and the benefits, some of those benefits of Passive. So, you know, there was a lot of funny structured products happening, you know, into the global financial crisis. Um, and Passive just represented simplification and you, you knew what you were buying. What it said on the tin was what you're getting. You didn't suddenly own some mortgage bonds in, on the East Coast of yeah. the US, you know. So, so I think, I think, that was a massive catalyst in, in the US, certainly. In our market, less so. In our, our, our market, our financial system actually held up quite well through the, the financial crisis. There were obviously a few events, but from an investor standpoint, it, it didn't have the same impact. So, so big point is, you know, when we started Core Shares, a lot of noise about how passive just didn't work in South Africa. You know, so yes, it's growing overseas. Market's too small. Yeah, market's too yeah. small. And, you know, you know, our costs that important and diversification is a big challenge in our market because it's small and structurally biased towards, you know, materials at that point in time. Then suddenly it was a nice purse problem. So we spent a lot of time showing how passive actually it does work and it can add value to your portfolio, you know, when you blend it into the total solution. And I think that for, 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 for me was key I mean, Gareth touched on core, core shares that, you know, in the DNA of the business is this idea of blending solutions, creating solutions, both using passive and active. Um, and I think to that point, a lot of the passive brands have been quite antagonistic. They'd said, like, guys, how, how on earth can you hold all these active managers that underperform? Just switch your whole thing to passive. Yeah. There's actually a place for both. You know, <laughs> there's, there's the opportunity to blend. So, so I think... Coming at it from a, a standpoint, not to say active is bad, but to say, actually, guys, passive's really good for your solution, and, and these are the reasons why. That's yeah. been an important journey for, 
for us. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, I mean, let's then get into it. I mean, so we, we as I said, the, the theme and the topic was uh, evidence-based investing, EBR. Um, I mean, so what, what, what is, I mean, I don't know what that, what is that? Well, um, let, let, let me start in a slightly different starting point. So, so when we have chat, chatted to clients about passive investing, and, and to Chris's point, we've had to work really hard in terms of educating the market yeah. around what is index investing? How does it all work? Is it relevant to South Africa? And we've done a lot of myth busting, a lot of general education over the last five to six years. Yeah. You still sit with this sort of idea that passive is somehow, you know, you're sort of taking this kind of backseat role and you're not actually actively participating in an investment process, which is which is wrong. And so we have been looking for a way of trying to articulate, yes, the use of index funds, yes, the use of passive, but what else are we saying? Well, what is the other message that, that's coming through? And so the way, so, so what evidence-based investing kind of means is that if, if sometimes investing is described as part art and part science, we believe in the scientific part, the evidence-based part. Okay. okay. Yeah. So if you go and see your doctor and he or she is citing the most recent medical journal supporting the use of a particular uh, medicine, very relevant to the COVID times. Okay, but, <laughs> yeah. okay. vaccines are evidence based. It's, I'm happy to stand by. Yeah. Happy to stand by that. Okay, you, you, you would you would be um, you would be in the same way. There's certain parts of the investment process that have got deep evidence uh, supporting them. So that, you know, diversification, for instance, yes. asset class returns through time. Yeah. the importance of cost. Components of the investment process that are structural, that are repeatable, that have got grounded in lots of academic research through through time versus parts of the investment process that are speculative and that you can't control what might interest rates do over the next three months what might global markets do over the next whatever nine months yeah. you can have a go and, and try and make a call and sometimes you'll get it right sometimes you'll get it wrong um, but what parts of the investment process can you take more of a mechanical research-based scientific part uh, a process with and and that um is what is this new acronym uh, globally called evidence-based investing it's not our own term yeah but we we're happy to own it because we think it speaks to indexing because how an advisor for instance can use indexing in the sort of systematic way to 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 help um build an outcome basically without having to call interest rates without having to call a political uh something or other you know which is highly speculative it's very interesting people love hearing about it oh, yeah but, but, but to get it right consistently is is very difficult and it's not particularly helpful for a client and a client's journey a financial planning journey and, and getting to the right outcomes okay so i mean like, interestingly again it, so again it talks to the cap fact if it's not it's not active versus passive yes. it's actually it's the combination and the piece you want to play in is that passive but actually it's the one the scientific piece yeah and how, the, and how and how those how then how that potentially goes together with an active manager in in, in, in yeah, yeah there's there's a bit of jargon we've used to try and explain yeah. in the past like controlling the controllable aspects yeah so when you sit down and there's all this investment noise which parts can you sort of settle on reliably and build a sort of a, a reliable system to to get an outcome um so it's quite sort of mechanical or systematic in terms of how you approach that. And if you think of it that way, so then you get to a point where you say, okay, well, this client needs to be 50% in South African equities. It's not that important whether he gets the right active management call. What's important is that he's in 50% equities, for instance. Yes. Let's use an index fund to, to okay. meet that 50% allocation. And it's just a very sensible, quite humble approach, actually, to, to building an outcome. Um, and I, I think it's interesting because what you – what you've seen in the last few years is a pivot from return charts, you know, like peer group rankings to client solutions, right? People looking, yeah. how do we create the highest probability or the best chance of actually achieving our client goal? Our client needs to draw income or needs to save for retirement. What, what gives us the best chance? So yeah. the, some of the ways that some of our clients uh, use our solutions is to create that stability of outcome. So we're going to hold a core you know, it's an equity component in passive in a core shares product. And then we'll have some kind of alpha plays, high conviction, active managers on the satellite. Um, but but what we confident is that we're driving that solution. And yes, we've got some alternative plays that, you know, hopefully generate alpha or, or risk management, you know, whatever their objective is. 
But we know that if this alpha play actually produces negative alpha over the next five years, which is possible, you know, yeah. probable actually, um, the solution is in place. The client is well positioned. So I think it's interesting because notwithstanding you know a lot of good active managers out there the, this core thing creates stability you know the core passive piece um and and it's all that evidence and and, and it, research behind it so it's interesting also like for me is that because you make as you've seen the the trend change or move you say the last five six years from advisors being asset or fund pickers and doing a combination themselves to going, hang on, actually, I'm not an asset manager. Um, I'm actually going to look after my client's kind of needs and yes. more focus on the goals. And then they go and actually partner with someone who can put kind of goal outcome solutions like a DFM Definitely. to get together for them. And again, there's, and hence kind of the, the growth in DFMs um, as well has come, come through because, because of how the, the industry's kind of moved on, which again, probably plays quite nicely into what you guys are trying to yeah, achieve. and and we've developed some really good working relationships with some yeah. of those DFMs who are using us for precisely the kind of reasons Chris has just highlighted, where they want to anchor their equity allocation, have core shares as the passive building block, and use one or two other managers um, around that. I, I think the point you're making around, you know, the, the movement towards passive investing and all the other stuff we've just been talking about and changes within the advisor markets are, are very interesting uh, parallels um, and something that we've been quite vocal we've really tried to support it i think that whole concept of gamma and advisors moving into their own sort of yeah. paradigm of adding value and, and kind of you know how their business plan is iterated um has certainly part of the sort of all these broader changes that are happening at the moment um, which we, we think is very encouraging and, and very important. And that term gamma, I mean, maybe just, I mean, I'm, it's obviously I think it's Morningstar kind of, I think they, they came up with it, but then maybe just explain it for the, for the audience in case. Yeah, yeah well, um, it, it is just that it's the, it's, the, it's, it's the value of advice as defined by Morningstar. And how do, you, how, do you get, how do you put a value to advice? It's through things like getting the right asset allocation for the client, not necessarily getting alpha for the client, it's making yeah. sure you've got the right asset allocation. Um, that you're in the right tax wrapper, for instance. Um, most importantly, that when there's something significant that happens in the market, like COVID, that your clients aren't doing silly things. I mean, you can imagine some of the financial mistakes that have happened over the last uh, 24 months where people have been switching in and out of funds uh, at the wrong time, not holding the course, not sticking to their strategy, yeah. but an advisor sitting in, and, and coaching a family through that whole environment is hugely, hugely valuable. Yeah. And, and so... The, the, the value of advice, that whole sort of coaching thing um, is this new sort of realm. Um, I'm reluctant to go too deep into it. No, 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 we, no. Aren't, we aren't advisors. This, no, just actually, well, we, we, just funny, to make sure it, that yes, we, but, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. we love the jargon. I, I, so I, I, saw, I saw a yeah. post the other day on, on LinkedIn and it, it actually hit home for me because it was an advisor saying, they wish asset managers would stop preaching to advisors about being advisors because we actually yeah. aren't advisors. Yeah. We're we, we, we asset good. managers and, and and so I think really what we want to say is we, ha we, ha we, we, we do empathize with advisors. We see the work that they're trying to do and the value that yeah. they add without being advisors ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's been some really important shifts within that industry is really uh, yeah. what I'd like to say. Yeah. yeah. And you talk about I mean, some of the, the tricky conversations the guys would have had, had to have, especially kind of March, April last year, when the kind of big market shocks come through. Yeah, it's been yeah, incredibly it's, difficult. Yeah. And then you add things like the riots recently. I mean, we've had a lot of client for, for report sure. backs recently. Yeah. It's tough for families to sort of see through some of these near-term events and, and hold on to their, their investment strategies and, and sort of see through some of the, the mist. It, it, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah. So, so advisors are playing a huge, huge role there. Um, yeah, it's, um, I've got a few more. One thing I want to pick up on, but just quickly, I've just noticed that we had the chat on for, for the audience, which we shouldn't have. So as a reminder, please post your questions on the Q&A tab. I see some questions coming through already, which is, which is great. We'll get to those uh, soon, but we've now turned the chat off. So don't, don't, try and, don't try and use the chat. Just go straight to the Q&A tab. Um, one thing I also want to unpack again, uh, interesting is, is often the mistakes made, and I mean, I, I make a mistake, is that you kind of, you kind of go, okay, you, and eat, you kind of think you're an, ET, you're an ETF business or you're an index business, or you're, but actually you're a passive business. Yeah. And underneath there, there's a whole bunch of different types of solutions and structures that, 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 that you can use. I mean, should we also unpack that a little and kind of 
I think that's because I think there can be confusion in the market in terms of what those what those things are. Maybe Chris, you can yeah. give this again. So, so we we did we actually describe ourselves as a full service asset management business, okay. which is interesting because yep. we often get boxed into the ETF corner. Yeah, which means we we do manage ETFs. It's a it's a big part of our business, um, but but actually increasingly so we we manage unit trusts and that's becoming even bigger so mm. you know we have an, an etf scheme and a unit trust scheme and then we manage segregated portfolios for larger institutional clients so you know the 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 again rewind etfs were challenging for advisors to access because they weren't available on a lot of platforms you know? yeah so 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 we we launched a, a unit trust scheme often we will run the parallel product so let's take our sa equity product our top 50 strategy we run it in ETF and unit trust. And we're not trying to say one product in ETF is better than unit trust, but we're trying to say it's different clients have different needs and different means of accessing them. So you want to buy the investment strategy, here it is as a unit trust. You know, it's on all the lists. Here it is as an ETF, it's it's on it's on the JC and you can trade it like a you know, like yeah, you can get your stock break and your stock break yeah, about for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so that's kind of the product width. And then and then the depth is to say, well, we run these like what what is synonymous with passive is like equity right so a top 40 everyone knows about the all share yeah but we run equity strategies we run smart beta property strategies we run multi-asset solutions um for for clients and for institutional managers so so really the the solution depth and breadth um is more than just what what is often pigeonholed into CISA general equity category where you know where do we rank relative to to the benchmark yeah. so so the, the idea is that Different clients will have different needs for different products, and actually, they just want to lever in those products into their solutions. So, so we try and cater to those to those needs as, as best possible. So the, the the consistent areas would be around cost. So obviously, everything yeah. we try and do would be low cost. It's primarily index based or, or rules based. Although even there, like in our multi asset, our own multi asset solutions. Yes, each of the asset classes or most of the asset classes are, are index based, but the actual asset allocation. Process is, is effectively about, active because yes, you, no, it's, it's strategic, yeah, but yeah. it's but it's we make an active cause to how much equity we want to hold. Yeah, for, for, yeah. For so you look at like the macro world and you hang on, this is we feel well, we, we don't do any tactical no tech, shifts. Okay. We just we get back to sort of the whole uh, scientific sort of process uh, of the sort of system driven uh, yeah. design. We look at what type of asset allocation is going to be, give you the best probability of receiving this outcome over prolonged periods of time. And that's and you, and you and stick and you stick and kind of stick to that. Stick, yeah, stick yeah. very tightly to that. Exactly. Um, and then we also realize that there's certain parts to the model that aren't as efficient. So in the fixed income realm, for instance, we actually farm out some mandates to some other fixed income managers where passive doesn't work uh, uh, so well. Um, but Chris, maybe you want to touch on kind of the key areas of of evidence based investing that we. You know, the, the, the sort yeah. of four or five cornerstones of so it. Yeah. It's actually really simple stuff. And, and you know, even in our multi-asset solutions, we don't, as Gary said, try and reinvent the wheel. We just yeah. pull all this data. We've got 120 years of data. We look at it. We model it. We look at what gives us, what mix of these assets gives us the best chance of achieving this client goal. Now, we've got a whole lot of constraints because of Reg 28 and stuff, but it's actually quite a simple process. And the beauty of it is it, it's pretty consistent. So it becomes repeatable. Now, what underpins that are things like costs. So, I mean, we quoted Morningstar earlier, but Morningstar, as you guys know, is a, is a research house. Their job yeah. was to research, initially was to research active businesses. And they came out with research, must be five years ago now, that said cost is the single largest determinant of a fund's future success. And they're famous for people, process, and philosophy. Right? That's what made them famous. And then they came out with research that said, actually, cost is not just quite important, and the then you throw a C into the, yeah, into the, yeah, into the yeah. triple PC. Yeah. So, and interesting, because it often gets missed, it's got nothing to do with active and passive. It's just saying two funds, active or passive, or both active, the one with the lowest cost has the highest chance of sure. succeeding. Yeah. And, and, and one of the reasons is costs is, 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 is the one element investing that we have absolute certainty about. We know we're going to strip a percent out of your returns every year. The returns we don't know, you know we don't know what that's going to do, and that erosionary effect of a high cost base is is, is detrimental to you know to client solutions and to portfolios. So so you know costs is one, diversification is another one, and it's simple. I mean that's a, actually a mathematical solve. It's not it's it's irrefutable, you know. So in our market it's a challenge. 
our, our beta product isn't uncapped. We capped the largest exposure at 10 because we, we know that our market is different. We need to provide the right kind of solutions for our market so that we don't have clients sitting with 25% in one, in one share. So the evidence actually points to a mathematical solve for holding a lot of shares so that if yeah. something goes wrong, you don't, yeah. the old cliche, have all your eggs in one basket. So, you know, diversification is another key underpin um, costs and asset class returns. I mean, we, again, we haven't reinvented the wheel. We pull this data set, it's called the Dimson, Marsh and Staunton. It's from 1902 to current. And we can see SA equities, SA bonds, uh, you know, SA cash, global, all the global markets. We get a good idea of how these things behave and how they coexist. Um, and, and we can understand how they can be combined to achieve, let's say, a return objective or a or a, or a client goal. So, you know, those are key, key, um, uh, the, the, the kind of three key underpins. And then the fourth element, which is which is interesting, and, and I know you want to chat about it, is this of factor-based strategies or smart beta. Smart beta, yeah. Um, and and that's, that's saying that if you apply a, a set of rules to an investment process, let's take value. You buy companies that are cheap, got a low price to book, or you know, however you're going to measure value, and you apply that consistently, over time, you can harvest a specific return. It's called a risk premium in the, in the research and essentially get rewarded for taking on additional risk. You're buying cheap companies. They're cheap for good reason. Maybe they've got high levels of you know, operating leverage, big fixed you know, overheads. <coughs> Buy them cheap. Excuse me. You can hold them and then get rewarded. So there's this kind of fourth pillar of our evidence-based investing um, philosophy, as, which, is, which is the, the evidence of factors. And again, this is not new stuff. This is you know, pharma French. We've all heard of you know, these academics and They've been researching this stuff for 40, 50 years, um, and it's both local and, and, and global. So, you know, that, that's kind of how, how it all fits yeah, together yeah. in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think might be quite a lot of questions coming through, which is, which is, which is great. Um, I mean, do we want to unpack uh, the Smart Peter conversation now, or, or should we? To you. Um, uh, yeah, let's, 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 I think, because again, I think it's quite a, if we can go more deep into that, because again, it, it's almost like a, I just understand it's like, it's a different way of, of like a different, almost a different product in a sense. But maybe let's talk about your property one as an example. You, had your, you said you had a smart beta property yeah. fund. Yeah, so in smart beta. So, yeah, the reason I always use, but I love, because our audience loves property. We always have questions about property. Okay. So that's, that's why we always we yeah. like to pick it. Is. So it's, property is actually an interesting case study, because this yeah. was like, this was a client-based solution in the, in the true sense. Smart beta, you could define as essentially anything that's not just uh, weighting a company by its size. So bigger company gets more weight in the portfolio, but looking at other metrics to weight it and then applying that systematically in a rules-based, low-cost environment. So active management does exactly that. They yeah. look at companies, they say, we're not just going to hold this company at 10% in our portfolio because it's big. We're going to hold it because we think it's cheap and it's high, of high quality. Yeah. Now, our property fund, was actually um, uh, a combination of quite a lot of work in the property market. Gareth mentioned some of our, our, our funds actually predate the, the core shares business into our Grinrod days, and pro the property ETFs were exactly that, um, where we've spent a lot of time talking to, in particular, the stockbroking community, how you should lever in property into your clients' portfolios. It generates income and growth and all these good things. And what we found is that those clients in particular we're using property primarily for its income yeah. generation yeah. You know, yeah. capability. So, so when we looked at that, we said, do clients want the property beta? Do they just want like asset class exposure, which is what the big institutional guys want typically? Or do our clients actually want this for income? Are they looking to generate income? So we, we designed our, our property smart beta fund. It's very simple. It says, let's look at the property counters in our market that over three years have paid out the best dividends. Um, and let's use that weighting technique. So let's weight them by their income generation capability. Um, and then we'll apply a whole lot of diversification rules. So we don't sit with, you know, more than 10% yeah. in an individual property counter. And if, if you look at our property beta, there's been points where growth points like 30% of our total market. So it's a real, real risk. So we just said, when we talk to our clients, what do they want from our property ETF? Well, they want income and they want diversification because they don't want to, you know, yeah. uh, you know, have single stock risk events. Yeah, which 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 we heard them what uh, two years ago. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
So it's interesting because a fund like that will often get asked, how's it performed? And in the last year, it's actually performed ahead of the benchmark. But for me, that's not really the performance metric. Like how's its, what's its income generation been like? Has that been yeah. stable? Has it actually achieved its, its objective? And that's what's important for, 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 for clients. So that's a classic example of saying, well, what does a client really need? Can we package this in a rules-based systematic investment process? Yes, we can. And then it's just labeled smart beta. So yeah, everyone yeah. just calls that smart beta. Yeah. But it can be very but, different to, to no, but that's to also that's why it's it's important that because again, what happens is the term smart beta gets thrown around. Yes. And to understand what that really is, actually is is I think that's 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 the that's that's the question. Um, yeah. I, I mean there's this wonderful definition by um, Stephen Kahn, the, the uh, BlackRock strategist, where he says that the, the thing about smart beta, it's actually none of it's new. What's new is how it's all being packaged and delivered to, to clients. So having a yield-centric property portfolio is not a new idea. Yeah, yeah. Putting it into a rules-based systematic format and then dropping the cost out of it and packaging it nicely so a client knows exactly what they're getting. That, that's the piece of okay. uh, innov- innovation. It's yeah, not yeah, even yeah. that new anymore either. Yeah. Uh, that, that we bring it to clients and packaging it so clients can look, I want that part, that particular product as part of my solution yeah. and they can use it. Yeah. And they know exactly what they're going to get. Doesn't matter if a portfolio manager comes and goes, the portfolio will carry on being uh, yes. you know, what it's designed yes, to do. Because it's got it's certain rules, but yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, when well, it gets into some questions, um, cool. So, first one is from Brandon Naidu. Thank you, Brandon. Again, some of these questions might go back to our, no, our, our yeah. original our original chat because they had come through earlier. Is is tracking error still a problem, or have we largely overcome this with with better tech recently? Well, so, so we look, we, we, we talk about, tra- just so I'm going to throw another curveball to the audience. We talk of tracking area in two different ways in our business. Okay? How the market typically thinks of tracking area is that if a, if a fund has done, if an index has done 10%, okay, how, how close is to that 10% has our fund done? Is it, yes. is it tight tracking area or is it a wide, wide tracking area? The typical rule of thumb is that the, the, the more liquid the underlying index is to, to track, the tighter that tracking area will be. So our top 50 funds, uh, top 50 index, for instance, that's a highly liquid, large cap universal stocks. Our, our tracking area is razor sharp. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so in that instance, tracking area is pretty, pretty good. Other, other examples like property, for instance, where the underlying shares might not be that liquid or the underlying shares yeah. might have quite a high bit off a spread. The tracking area would, would typically be, would, would wider. Would typically be wider. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, industry wide, it's it's not even it's it's not something that we it's expected of us that our tracking area is is razor sharp, and we've got lots of um, really good programs and lots of good processes to ensure that, generally speaking, we we're running our process with a tight tracking area. In fact, blow our horn for a moment. We actually won a couple of awards recently for for our for our tight tight tracking area. The other, um, so yes, I think industry wide, it's pretty good. The other way that we, we talk about tracking error, just for your interest sake, is we, we look at how, how much tracking error active products have relative to, uh, to, to the index. And we're meaning tracking error is how different they are yeah. to, to the index. And often we actually put that forward as quite a positive thing. So if, you, if you're going to be putting a solution together that's got, say, 50% in the index, what's the point of putting it together with an active manager who's got a very, very tight tracking error? Those are the active managers that we would criticize, the sort of super tanker yes. funds that yes. hug the index themselves, yeah, just, don't really want to take no, any bets. Nowhere to move, eh? Yeah, they yeah. just want to sort of, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, muck along along the market and they're not going to get into too much trouble. We would actually promote this idea of having high active share or taking a bit of risk outside of the index and having some tracking error in, in, in the solution. So that's the other context in which we yeah. often look at tracking yeah. error. So smart beta, for instance, how much tracking error does a value index have relative to a market cap index? And it would have a high tracking error because it, it, it would look very different to the market as yeah. sometimes. So we use it sometimes in that context as well, just for your, for your, for yeah, your interest. That's, yeah. But it's interesting because, again, essentially, if you, if you say you've got portfolios, their job is to track the index. Correct. So, and it's you almost... There's, I wouldn't say there's complete certainty, but there's kind of that, that's what it, what it does versus you're going to an active manager who maybe is just doing the same thing because of their, their, their size was what's, 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 what's the point. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they might be more, more expensive. 
Yeah. Um, but but I, you know, we often so yeah. we often get asked about um, you know when does the index rebalance? What is the kind of the tracking? Area? These are questions that are become quite technical. And if I, my my general kind of kind of response is to say they should be really far down the list of questions that are asked of a, mm. of a passive man. What you really want to focus on first is the investment case, like why. Yeah. Why this index in this context and the solution sort of start there, look at co- as a starting point. And, and, and the the tracking error and some of those aspects kind of come quite lost in the overall due okay. diligence of, of the product, I would say, uh, okay. by and cool. large. Yeah. Cool. So, um, do you want to add? Well, no, I mean, I was just going to add that it's interesting you, you, you brought kind of the DFM market into the, you know, into the conversation earlier. And I think the DFM market has become wise to big equity funds, for example, with constraints. Maybe they're too big or maybe it's business risk, so they constrain tracking error to 3%. Mm-hmm. And they say, well, we've got, a, we've got a total solution here you know, with a 3% tracking error, which, so they can only take a little bit of active share. They can only take a few active yeah. bets. And that's costing us 150 basis points, 1.5%. We could, we could do that. And... You know that's cool, but but we could say let's put forty percent, fifty percent into a passive solution at twenty basis points, yeah, and go find some high conviction guys at six percent active share, and we come out at a similar solution at a cost that's half, and and so you get the same outcome for for much lower fees. So so I think the the, the solution providers in our market are becoming more and more wise to this concept of yeah. I would I find quite fascinating also as a minute. Because I always, my always thought was that you kind of, you very much going, put a little bit of passive in your portfolio from a cost perspective. But actually, it's not only just a cost, because again, you can you can compare it to, a, to an actor manager and you're replacing quite a large chunk. And I think that makes, that I think is also quite, it's not just a, not just a cost, cost discussion. Uh, it's an overall portfolio and the role it plays in the portfolio yeah, is yeah. also really important. The, the other narrative that's been busted even recently is the idea that you buy passive and markets are, are, are running. And the only reason why passives worked over the last 10 years mm-hmm. has been all this cheap money in the markets and, and the global <laughs> stock markets and this is a sort of you know, bullish environments and yeah. therefore passive has done well. But it's actually not about that. It's about actually shifts within the industry around how solutions are, yeah. are being built. And quite honestly, passives perform pretty well in these downward and choppy markets uh, uh, too. So, so like if you look at the SPIVA results, yes, active managers did a lot much better in the last say, 12 months or so, but actually not, not completely. So on average, they still underperformed yes. uh, the, the market. So, so, so yes, there's a bit of an argument to be made around the whole risk side of things and when markets are down, but generally speaking, passive still performs uh, pretty well. So that's been another narrative that we've had to bust over the last sort of five, six years when we've been building out of course shares um, as to when passive works. There's no such thing as that. I think it, it's, it's kind of how you use it. Yes, it's in the, the in the solution. I think, that, I, think that's the, that's, I think for me, that's a key message actually of today yeah. is it's not about... So you said like it's not this. So we still see articles come out. These are the top ten performing yeah. funds. Yeah, it's not about. It's not. It's, and these funds outperform passives. It's actually all vice versa. It's not about that. It's about the roles that the different solutions play in the client's portfolio. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to carry on with the questions because we can keep keep going all, all day, and I feel we're not going to give the audience enough enough air time. Um, next question from anonymous: Is it possible for a passive investor strategy to outperform? An actively managed portfolio in downturns. I think we've just answered that one. I so, think, unless yeah, you want to, I mean, the, the exact number is if you look at the crash we had in COVID, if you take our top 50 fund, so not the index, the fund, the real money, around 73% of active managers underperformed that passive solution from peak to trough. So during the crash. Yeah. So it's not just possible. Again, it, there's a high chance it will happen. And that's the kind of what Gareth was talking about yeah. earlier. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no. Come on. Yeah, it's not. Um, another one from Brandon Nadu. Um, okay. How many active funds make purely an asset allocation call and use passive building blocks? Do we have any stats in SA? Well, there are definitely solutions providers who are building yeah. like multi asset funds just using indices. So, I mean, our own multi asset funds are built a bit like that. They're, they're, there's quite a big category now in the balanced fund market in South Africa of just Kind of rules-based passive uh, passive funds where there's a strategic asset allocation and a number of different index funds, and they generally speaking do pretty well because they've got such a good cost head start to them. 
Um, the equity building block is quite difficult to beat, as we know, statistically. So it, it's become an, a growing kind of important part of the, okay. of, of the market. Um, yeah, no, I mean, we've spoken a lot about evidence. If you look at, say, in a multi-asset solution, the evidence be- behind return variance. So like, how does your portfolio behave? Asset allocation describes 90% of return variance in a multi-asset solution. So it means that what's actually describing the behavior of your portfolio is your asset allocation calls, not your stock selection on the underlying necessarily. And I mean, therefore, you should be able to just have a completely passive set of building blocks and actively manage a, a solution, you know, to, yeah. to your heart's content. Yeah. Um, some more questions. How the Matisse in? Um, he's got a couple. One's a long one. Um, so I'm actually going for your short one first, Helva. Active managers point out that S&P makes money from the growth of passive. Is S&P conflicted in respect of their SPIVA analysis? Yes, they are, probably. But it's not the only analysis. So uh, Morningstar has similar analysis. If you were to ask any independent firm to, do, to run the analysis, they'd come to the same, same conclusion. They, they, they're conflicted, but it doesn't mean that their analysis is wrong. <laughs> so, so, you, you know, it's, they, they've generated the stats and they can back up those stats. Yes, they are driving an agenda, to be honest. Yeah. But, but it, it's, still, it's still fact. Um, so you can, you can go into what it is that they're publishing and, and, and unpack it all, and you'll see exactly how they got to their to to, yes. to their results. Okay. Um, so no, yeah. So not, they are actually bells and whistles that they're kind of hiding stuff. It's, it's no, all, no, it's all, no, it's no. They, in fact, they, it's very transparent. They deal with survivorship bias. They deal with uh, they qualify which indices they use. They um, you know they bring in a lot of um, really good um, research techniques into generating that report. I think it would be disingenuous to say that they don't have an agenda. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, so I think that's fair. Um, but it doesn't mean that the, the speed report through time hasn't been uh, accurate. Um, yeah, it's, it's a bit like, you know, if you walk through the airport, you'll always see when there's a top performing fund. So we were the top 10, top decile or top yeah. fund over 10 years. It's not false, but obviously they have an agenda. They're advertising the fact. What, yeah. What's interesting about Spiva, though, in contrast to that, is that like we are the best fund in the market for the last 10 years, usually lasts a year, and then it disappears because it's hard to be the top fund over 10 years consistently. Spiva is every six months, they produce the same report. So the consistency around that research okay. is, I think, what for investors actually adds the most value is to say, and we do it, we, we say, okay, this is Spiva point in time, but this is Spiva over a long period of time. So, so that consistency of reporting, I think, is valuable. Where, where you really have to be skeptical as an, as an investor is if you haven't heard of a manager and then suddenly their billboards are everywhere because yeah, because it's probably opportunistic, right? So I think, yes, they're incentivized, but they're genuine in, in so far as that they report on Spiva numbers every six months consistently. If the numbers are bad, they publish them. If the numbers are good, they publish them. Okay. Yeah. So I think okay, that's, yeah, yeah that, that, that there's something to be said about that, I think. Okay. So I hope that answers your question, Oliver. Uh, question from Graham Dix. Where do I find the returns on active versus passive funds historically? Um, so I suppose Morningstar could, could probably, I'm sure they could. Yeah, there, there are a few. I mean, the, the SPIV report that we've just been talking yeah. about, so S&P versus active is the SPIV report. They've got their own dedicated website on their on their uh, um, and main website that one could go and have a look at. And it's so. spelled S-P-I-V-A. Yeah. 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 So, okay, so, so Graham could go and, go and, go and look that Spiva up. And, they yeah. actually run SPIV in most markets. So okay. we, um, we are one of probably about a dozen markets that they run this exercise in. Um, and so it's got, yeah, it's got its own dedicated area. Okay. Otherwise, yeah, Morningstar tools, um, other access to CISA data, you'd be able to pull that up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Uh, so I got two more and then we'll carry on, but I mean, it's, it's quarter past already and it's yeah. as our time flies. So I'm going to get to Harvard's long question. Almost all SA equity trackers track an index that contains at least 40% offshore equity exposure. Uh, investors seeking off- offshore equity exposure can achieve it elsewhere in a far more diversified and cost-effective way. Why are so few index funds available that track SA Inc. specifically without these arbitrary offshore equity exposures? Uh, well, that's... I, I mean, I, if I'm correct, um, we're talking about like our Rand Hedge stocks. We're talking about 
PHP yeah. goals. No, ten cent PHP enrichment battery. Okay. I'm yeah. trying to yeah. To get spot yeah. On. So it's it's an interesting one because there is this kind of um, split in our market where you've got your uh, inward listed companies, the offshore. I mean, Nasdaq is not in, inward listed. Interestingly, it's it's the it's the biggest, but it's yeah. but it's not. Um, and and we do have clients who want to pull the two levers, so they want to say SA Inc only versus offshore. I, I think the reality is that w- maybe there's a space for that that kind of product. Maybe there's a space to say like we're going to just carve the Aussie into inward listed Rand Hedge and 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 SA Inc. Um, we, we don't see the, the demand, the investor demand for it. And one of the reasons why it's like, we've got a small universe to start with. So as, as South African investors, we've got 160 shares in the Aussie, liquid shares, probably 60. So then you pull out the Rand hedges and you're probably sitting with 30 yeah. to 40 liquid shares. Um, and suddenly if that has to be half of your retirement solution because you're in a high equity fund, you're taking on unnecessary risk. So I think I think perhaps in part, you know, that, 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 that's a function of, of, of our market. But if you look globally, because it's interesting, we always cite it locally, and it's, it's probably because it's exaggerated. But globally, if you look at, say, the S&P 500, half of their revenue is driven yeah. offshore, and, and no one's bleating to, to, to kind of strip out the, that revenue stream. Because what it, what it talks to is the globalization of financial markets, of companies, it's an it's an evolution of our of our of our economy, right? Globally, so so it, it is an interesting question because every now and then it comes up. I'm I'm not sure there's the demand potentially for it, but what, what you do need to differentiate from is um, South African listed shares that are deemed local for like a, a pension fund product mm. versus those shares that are, are, are truly global. So we know some of our big managers, for instance, in their equity fund, they will have 30% actually invested offshore. Yes. So yes. that then becomes quite difficult to compare that fund, which is a hybrid actually between global yes. and local, yes. to a pure locally listed uh, yeah. product. And and yeah, so the, yeah, the comparisons there are tricky. So you almost actually have to carve out what the local component mm-hmm. Uh, uh, is actually to, to, to look yeah. at that comparison. I'm not sure. Okay, so one more question uh, from Greg. How do you distinguish between a pension fund investor in your ETF tax-free versus discretionary invest, investment taxable? Well, there'll be, it, it depends which wrapper has invested in our product. That, they will be able to do that. Okay. So we won't be able to do that work at an ETF level. Okay. But, but the administration platform where they made the investment from will be able to do that. We'll be able to do that with. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Now, I was going to say the tax is usually dealt with by the last regulated intermediary. Mm. So in the ETF world, we, we are never that that intermediary because there's always a, yes. a stock Someone broker or a platform yes. somewhere in between yeah. us. Yeah. Cool. Happy. Cool. Okay. So then moving on, uh, I just want to talk about responsible investing because this is yeah. it's a really hot topic. Uh, it has been for a while uh, or, or ESG. I mean, so how do you... How do you incorporate that into kind of your, your investment process, the response to investing piece? Well, well the, the interesting starting point there is that you know, there's, this, there's this analogy that passive funds you know, aren't going to help climate change and they'd be not responsible uh, investors. Yeah. And, and actually, that whole argument has been turned on its head uh, in a big way globally because what, what global companies have found when they go through their shareholder register well, hang on a second, some of our biggest shareholders are passive funds. And so BlackRock and Vanguard and the people you're talking about earlier have developed huge ESG and SRI processes, not because they can, not because they can easily sell a share out of the S&P 500 funds, but, but they want to engage with the management team. So it becomes this active engagement stewardship model. Which, so, uh, yeah. so, so, so basically, because of their size, they automatically hold a big chunk of a, of a stock of a company, and they're not allowed to sell it because it's in the index. It's in the index. So, so what they invest, they in, go and then they go, they go, they go to the shareholder meetings, precisely. put their hand up. So, vote. so globally, right yeah. now, some of the most active, engaged ESG yeah. investors in the world are, are the big passive houses. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So that's yeah. a, that's a good starting point, right? The other interesting thing is that index firms, by their very nature, S and P, MCI, FTSE, and others, are very data heavy businesses. Yeah. And mapping ESG is a very data-heavy process. What's your carbon footprint? Let's have a look at the makeup of your board, what are your social programs and so forth. That's data that needs to be mined 
and kept and managed. And who's really good at that? The index houses, S and P, MSCI, and everything. Yeah, yeah. So, so between the the strong engagement model that's coming through from big um, big passive houses, from the all of the work that the the index firms have done over the years. In fact, we'd go so far as to say they're way ahead of most active houses. Active houses are very often buying their data from big data houses owned by the likes of yeah, yeah. uh, S&P and that, okay? Okay, th then you get down to what we at Core Shares are, 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 are doing about it. And, and, and Chris, please chime in. But there, there are a few things. So, so we would like, we are building our own stewardship model, our own active engagement model. So we have a proxy voting policy. We don't believe in passively holding shares. We see it as part of our fiduciary yeah. responsibility to, to vote shares and, and have a policy around a voting share so that that deals with the the active engagement then you have whether we want to launch a product that really rewards those companies that are high achievers with their own esg metrics and we we do now run um at least one product like that and, and potentially others still to come where it's an esg index where companies are rewarded because they've got particularly good esg uh, uh, scores so, so it's, it's a dynamic uh, um topic that you've touched on but certainly the the thing we want to squash right up front is that passive on playing our, our role in this in fact we yeah are now i think it's, it's going to become a very important differentiator for, for passive firms and active firms alike uh, uh going forward yeah yeah, I think what's important is there's like there's all this focus on ESG funds. So, you know, one fund that like yes. says rewards companies. You know, this is a great ESG fund, and, and we're launching it, and clients jump into it. But what is important is when you look at the total asset base, how can you apply these concepts of ES and G, you know, across that total asset base because that's more meaningful, and and that talks to the active stewardship, yeah. proxy voting, engagement, and so forth. So holistically. ESG shouldn't be a carve out. It should be applied consistently across, across yeah. your yeah. your whole Absolutely. your whole you know asset base. Um, and then, by all means, you know if there's an interesting ESG you know approach that that seems to make sense, that can manage risk, that can lead to more sustainable returns for investors, and at the same time, better outcomes for society in general, mm -hmm. yeah. then then that's great. The, the challenge with that is is just massive diversion of beliefs. So what you think is ESG is different to me and Garrett, you know. So. Yeah. And it's, I think it's important, again, it's when I should chat with a guy called John Duncan from Old Mutual. Yeah. And he, I mean, actually, what, again, what he also speak, what spoke about is it the importance of responsive investing for our clients. So, our, yes, the older clients maybe aren't as green, but the, the, the younger clients, like millennials, who are now kind of approaching 40, who are now actually your future wealth clients as an advisor, they, they care about this stuff. Yeah. They're asking the advisors the questions. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's becoming, so, and I think that's, uh, that, that really hit home for me because again, it's, it's not just about a process. It's actually, it's across the whole kind of value chain. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, and, and it, it, the, you know, the, the interesting part of ESG is that the, the companies who tend to perform quite well, often in ESG industries, are those that have got the, the most to lose. So if you're sitting there as a manager of a mining company, you know you're in big trouble because you're mining of like a finite resource and these millennial investors you've just spoken about <laughs> aren't going to like what you're doing. No. So, so you actually, ironically, put more time in than anyone else. Yeah. So you end up with, with a, a, a huge program around it on all, on all things. And because you've got a big program around it, it means that you actually get a good ESG you score. score, high. score. Yeah. So you then have to differentiate between companies that have got a good ESG score map like that versus companies who make revenue through changes in the how we are approaching climate change so you now get indices globally that only invest in you know renewable energy stocks for instance now we haven't got that niche in the south african market yet but certainly globally if you wanted to go and pick a global etf that only has clean energy stocks you yes. they'd be available you, you, but it's, it's becoming but, uh, very it's becoming very sort of niche that yeah but, uh, but i think it's it's actually nailed on the head Chris, is it actually it's about your overall process? Exactly. That's what it's about. And actually, yeah. and again, what's important is if you if if you invest in companies that take responsive investing seriously, in the long term, they will yeah. they will do well. I mean, yeah. a few macro things might have to work out as well, but like they'd sure. they'd be doing, they should be doing a good job from a business perspective. So I'm aware of time. So just a couple of things. So let's just just quickly as a kind of a wrap up on the on the topic. Um, and then maybe we'll have one one more question from the audience. Is and we've spoken out. How, what's the best way, in your guys' mind, the client advisors 
can kind of include passives in their, in their solution for clients? So, so I think we've mentioned a few times that yeah. we've done a lot of good work with the DFMs who are really well placed to do the whole active passive blending bit. Um, they also, so chat to your DFM as a starting point as to how they're working with passive and whether they've spoken to us. Secondly, um, we have launched our own multi-asset funds yeah. that are low cost, our best house view on asset allocation uh, that could sit alongside a more actively tactile type asset allocation call. Yeah, I've, I was going to add to that. So, you know, if you're an advisor who doesn't use a DFM, you're using, say, multiple multi-asset portfolios, you, you know your client better than better than anyone. And if you look at the, not just in our products, so we've got two multi-asset solutions, the whole market, you'll pretty much be able to find at least one or a blend of two passive solutions that hits your client's asset allocation requirements on the head. To hold that consistently is extremely important. And then and then kind of blend. So getting that stability yeah. out of that, that core, core that, satellite. Because yeah, you know, in the in the active context of multi-asset, you don't control asset allocation. It, it changes through time and, and yes. that can be problematic for your clients. So yeah. so yeah, and that is how it's being used, you know, to, to a large extent as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I have one more question for the audience. Um, from Peter, you recently changed one of your funds. The, the equally way to top 40 was changed to a SA beta. Yeah. What was the reason for this and has it paid off? Well, it was to, there were a few reasons for it. Um, it was mainly to neaten up our product set and to align our house view to a few specific strategies. So in, in, in the market cap space, we've got our top 50s, our flagship market cap wave strategy. In the smart beta factor world, um, we believe in combining multiple factors together, so value, momentum, quality, and so forth, rather than having single factors as one particular strategy. The top 40 equal weight was, in, the, in essence, a single factor strategy. It was an equal weighted strategy that looks at diversification and smoothing out the size of the portfolios, whereas we would rather advocate for this multi-factor framework. So, um, it, yeah, it, it's, uh, we felt that we were both synchronizing our own product set, but also doing good by the client in terms of what we believe was the best um, long-term version, ver version of, okay. of that particular uh, fund. I mean, has it worked out? I mean, it's only been about 18 months or so since, since we launched okay. it. I think the, the returns of that fund weren't great up until recently, and they've actually really picked up quite nicely that, just, just recently. Um, yeah. But it's also, that's, that's, I mean, that's a, it's a short-term number still. So it's, exactly. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, and I, sorry, then Brandon's got one more. Uh, this is a variation of his uh, Sorry, it's Reefers. Um, uh, is liquidity concern just too much in a small cap tracker? Um, there seems to be much, much more appetite for risky plays. Yeah, yeah, yes, there's a short answer for that. I mean, when it comes to really yeah. illiquid markets, that's when you need active managers to yeah. come in and finesse that. Um, yeah. Okay, no? cool, happy. Okay, so we've just got three minutes left. And actually, what I'm going to do is change tack completely. And we're going to chat to Gareth. Gareth is about to run a thing called the Rhino Peak Challenge. Um, so, again, kind of a little, so obviously a challenge for you. You've raised some money uh, and also a conservation conservation play. I mean, I mean, Innate has actually kind of got behind him on this. But maybe, maybe Gareth, give us give us a sense of what it's, what it's all about. Yeah, well, I, th I think lock lockdown and COVID has brought home the fragility of, of ecosystems. I think it's also one of the reasons why ESG is such a big, uh, big topic. Yeah. And to keep myself sane, I've been doing a lot of running throughout the whole uh, uh, COVID uh, environment. Uh, and then I was invited to do this conservation fundraiser. You basically have to uh, run up the Rhino Peak, which is in the southern Drakensberg, beautiful part of the world, uh, very close to my heart. So you run up the mountain uh, and you try and raise as much money doing that. Uh, and and Rhino Peak, uh, uh, the money goes to rhino conservation and other endangered species uh, in the area like the, the vulture uh, and the crane and so forth. Um, so I've pinged some of my work associates, including Innate, who very yeah. kindly have uh, put forward um, some funding towards it. Um, greatly appreciate it. I'm going to be wearing an Innate shirt next weekend. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's a bit of fun. Uh, the goal is to raise about a million rand for conservation. Um, and uh, there are about 35 runners taking part. And it's just a really uh, fun, worthwhile thing. Um, and, yeah, uh, 
looking yeah. forward to it. And if any other audience want to contribute, if they, if they want to contribute, I, it would be I'd be absolutely stoked. Yeah. It's uh, the, the the website's called RhinoPeakChallenge.co.za. You could also be a sign up and be a runner next year if this sort of thing interests you. Um, yeah, and and, or, or see and I think you would have posted something on LinkedIn as well. Am I right? I, I, I have. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm going to. I'll put a couple more posts up. Yeah. Between now so, and this weekend. so yeah. So it's next week. Next week, Sunday. So if you Saturday, are yeah. Saturday, 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 sorry, yeah. the sixth. Um, yeah. So if anyone's interested, um, just yeah, I think you can look look you up. Um, actually, some I think um, yeah, it's uh, I think Simon has just posted on 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 the, the chat as well. So, okay. Thank yeah, you. yeah. So there we go. Yeah. Cool. Okay, it's ten thirty on the dot. Just quickly wrap up. First of all, Gareth, Chris, thanks very much. We yeah, really thank appreciate. You. Thanks yeah. for having yeah. us. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a really good good conversation. Hopefully, we've kind of we've really brought the kind of passive world kind of practically in, in, into kind of advisors' lives and hope that they've got a better understanding of it. Um, just last um, housekeeping housekeeping rules. Um, CPD, as we spoke about, one CPD point. Um, you should get it. Otherwise, you will. Otherwise, you you'll have to do the short assessment. Um, yeah. Well, next we've got two more webinars coming up uh, before the year's out. Um, so look out for those in end of November, beginning of December. Um, and otherwise, I think that's that's it. Yeah. No. Yeah, thanks, thanks guys. Answer. And thanks very Thank much. You. Yeah. Really appreciate. It. Innate is a registered trademark of Stanlib Wealth Management Pty Limited, an authorized financial services provider.